To the point here, what is water? Most of you are mechanical engineers, and I think most of you would answer it's H2O. It's got a molecular weight. It uh, you know it's, uh, tends to form droplets. Got a high surface tension. It's polar. Uh, you know you find it in nature, and uh, you know it's a it's a reasonable answer. Except you you rarely ever, except in a lab, find water in this form. And even if you you know take pure water and you just sort of have this cup of water, and you, you put it out on the desk here. What's the pH? If I had just molecularly pure water, and I just you know I put it in a in a cup and I put it out here on the desk and I leave it for a day or two, what's its pH? How many people below seven? It's uh, twenty-five percent of the class. For uh, who, who says it's more than seven? Less than seven. Okay, it's about three quarters. Uh, so what is the pH? Uh, we got too many answers here. All right, between six and seven, who votes between six and seven? Uh, between five and six. Okay, and who are the chemical and environmental engineers in the room? Uh, about the same group of people who said between five and six. So, uh, folks, between five and six, can somebody uh, explain to the rest why the pH might be there? Yeah. There's uh, well, <coughs> carbon dioxide in the air, and that, uh, and all sorts of other things that dissolve in the water reduces pH, and uh, so that's why the pH of water is a little less than seven. Okay, so it depends what you mean by a little less. So if you vote for between five and six, you know it's more than ten times less. Uh, pH is a lot yeah, scale, yeah. right? So, okay. uh, you know, <laughs> so you know the fact is things get into water, CO2 being one, uh, somewhat acidifies it, but you know not as acidified as the colas we drink and things like that. So water is actually complicated stuff. So uh, I'm not expecting you to read this uh, table here. But you know it's, it's strange stuff, right? It's maximum densities at 4 degrees. Uh, it solubilizes just about everything, at least a little bit. Uh, this is uh, seawater, right? Uh, not the most useful stuff in the world, uh, seawater. Uh, atmospheric water. Well, I guess unless you're a saltwater fish, then you think that's great. Yeah, seawater's great. Uh, atmospheric water, right? Uh, you know, surface waters in California, New York, and Ohio. This is uh, column A, column B, column C. Uh, you see different amounts of uh, uh, basically silicon dioxide there, iron, chrome, magnesium, etc. So these are cumulative distribution functions for. Uh, various waters sampled from the U.S. and various uh, constituents. So you can imagine, you know, take any particular water might have any combination of uh, these elements in it. So it's it's a complicated substance. Uh, not all of it is useful. And we think about sustainability. Just uh, you know, using one definition that's that's fairly reasonable. This idea that water should support the ability of human society to endure and flourish into the indefinite future, remember sustainability is about the future, without undermining the integrity of the hydrological cycle or the ecosystems that depend on it. So if humans are you know, withdrawing 100% of the water uh, from an ecosystem, and uh, even if they're returning it, uh, obviously that's going to be disruptive. Uh, you know, and there are regions where you'll have you know, more than 40 percent, 60, 80 percent of uh, the water available just sort of exerted by, by humans. What's this hydrological cycle? What's meant by that? All right, the water cycle. What is the water cycle? Go ahead. Water evaporates, then condenses, and then go around. <laughs> okay, it goes around. So it ends up in the atmosphere. It comes back. Uh, let's uh, take a look at that. I'm going to just jump ahead here. Uh, right here. So this is uh, a little bit hard to read. It comes from a Scientific American article. Uh, you know, looking at the availability of water. There's plenty of water. We're not running out of water. 
you know, one of the interesting things, sometimes I'll talk to groups about climate change and uh, one of the concerns people have is they're going to run out of water. Well, and, you know, in a closed system like the Earth, the water isn't really going anywhere. It's moving around, and it may not be where we need it when we want it. And populations have established themselves uh, conveniently located, uh, often near coasts or near rivers or uh, plentiful uh, sources of, of good water. And uh, if the water moves or we use it all, and uh, you know, it just kind of goes down the river or it goes into the atmosphere, you know, we spread it over the land for irrigation, then it evaporates and then ends up somewhere else. It doesn't really help us out. So in this uh, chart, green water is being defined as water that is absorbed by soil and plants, then released back into the air, and humans can't get to it. Okay? The blue water is collected in lakes, rivers, wetlands, groundwater, and that is available for uh, withdrawal. So this just shows, in terms of the water that falls onto land, in terms of precipitation, uh, what fraction is green and what fraction is, is blue. Okay, and of course, in theory, we can get water from the oceans, but that is very energy intensive and uh, remains a challenge to uh, get fresh water out of the sea without too much of, a, of an energy input or financial input. Okay. Uh, down here below the uh, slope figure is uh, the fraction that is uh, used in agriculture. So uh, you've got, and it's out of 100%. Okay, you see the majority uh, actually uh, in terms of agriculture comes from the sky in terms of water input. But a fair amount uh, comes from irrigation. Okay, so this ends up being a, a decent fraction of the total. So if we look at, for instance, just looking at the U.S., I'm going to try to find this figure. All right. So how, how we use the water uh, we have access to. Right? This is about 10 years old, so I can't uh, tell you right now if it's uh, changed appreciably or not. You see about um, three-fourths of the water usage comes from surface water, and about a quarter comes from groundwater. And about half, just under half, goes to agriculture and uh, roughly the same amount in power plants. But you can see the quality that comes out. So in terms of agriculture, um, you know, much less of that is actually returned. Its quality is relatively poor. Right? So it's interacted with the soil, might get salty, what have you. And power plant water is uh, uh, fairly higher quality. Obviously, the municipal wastewater uh, needs to be treated. We'll talk more about that. And the industry water, you know, you probably don't want to be interacting with uh, water that might have been used in a plating process, for example, or a cutting fluid like we talked about earlier. But actually, you know, industry may be the biggest polluter of water, but it's not the biggest usage. It's the least in terms of these categories. Okay, so thinking about water, and you know, this is sort of a U.S. perspective. Obviously, there is a, a global perspective, and that tends to be where the definition, at least used by Gleek here, um, they list seven principles of water resource sustainability. So basically, that a water requirement will be guaranteed to all humans to maintain human health, uh, to restore and maintain the health of ecosystems. Uh, so this is, a, this is a quantity, right? But there's also a quality. So water quality will be maintained to meet certain minimum standards, and those will vary uh, based on the location and how the water is used. So you know, think about uh, you know, the, the needs that a lawn might have for water quality versus drinking water. There are different standards. And most of the US, we treat the quality standards as if they're the same. But uh, reclaimed water 
uh, certainly can be used and in parts of the country is used. And that's uh, growing. OK, so human actions will not impair the long-term renewability of freshwater stocks and flows. So what do you think, what would be an example of a human action that would impair the long-term renewability of freshwater stocks and flows? I think the first three are reasonably obvious, but this one's not as obvious. <coughs> Just like building a dam or rerouting the water or something like that. Okay, that'll certainly work. What else? Good. Uh, natural gas drilling. Uh, if you do it improperly, you can um, paint groundwater and it can't be used. <clears throat> so uh, that would affect the renewability or it would affect the freshness of the water? I think it would, affect, it would affect the freshwater stock that you have. Certainly, uh, you know, actions we might take, uh, so you think of that in some ways as an industrial process. Uh, industrial processes uh, do have water concerns associated with them. So any of those could be, um, you know, mining might be another example, right, where we might have concerns about water quality. Uh, go ahead. Draining of uh, the wetlands so the aquifers can't recharge. Draining wetlands. Uh, these are excellent examples. Go ahead. Draining a well or like yeah, just a well. Of some sort. Sure. Or, you know, pumping an aquifer dry. Good example. Climate change. Surprised somebody didn't mention that. So a lot of populations get uh, their water from melt water, and if the snowpack or it disappear, then those downstream populations would be another concern. Great examples. So, uh, you know, here now maybe the bullet number five is uh, sustainability for uh, water engineers, right? So data on water resources, um, or I should say data on the water resources available, the use of quality, will be collected and made accessible to all parties. So, uh, you know, the idea that, you know, where the water is, how it's used, uh, its quality is, uh, you know, a public good. Since we all need water to live, that actually makes some sense. Institutional mechanisms will be set up to prevent and resolve conflicts over water. There are places in the world where there are conflicts over water. I see some heads nodding. What are they? Sudan was mentioned. Go ahead, Lisa. Well, even here in the United States, like New Mexico and Texas argue over the Rio, the Rio Grande. New Mexico and Texas over the Rio Grande. Anybody heard about the border dispute between Georgia and Tennessee a few years back? Uh, that's a long story. Look it up. It's uh, what's fun. <laughs> Somebody else have their hand up? Tibet Lakes. Tibet's one. Yeah, Great Lakes. There was some talk for a while about uh, taking fresh water out of the Great Lakes and sending it all down to Arizona, which some people were up in arms about. Up in arms about. So, and then the idea about decision making and conflict resolution being a democratic process. Right? Again, because the stakeholders and the stakes themselves are so high. So, these are goals. Somebody mentioned um, Sudan, right? Just pictures uh, from that area. It's certainly not the only uh, source of conflict now. We talk about northern Sudan, southern Sudan now. Uh, but certainly, water uh, has been one of the uh, aggregating factors and some conflict there. Uh, the Aral Sea, what's the story of the Aral Sea? Does anybody know this one? Uh, it's drying out. It's drying out. So that's uh, basically what's being shown here in the upper right in the satellite photos. What's the reason for it? I would assume um, overuse and, well, no, it's a C. Never mind. I don't know. Uh, that's actually a good guess. Go ahead, John. Do you have something to do with the cotton production? Where? I don't know. I, I was Somewhere in... adjacent to it? That's, that's yeah, a pretty good guess. Uh, yeah, actually, uh, so irrigation, right, for water-intensive crops uh, was the biggest uh, factor contributing. So. Uh, and you can imagine living in that area. I mean, the satellite photo basically says it all. 
the also, uh, you know, water's a concern from the perspective of uh, children. So if you look at the state of the world's children as uh, reported here uh, by UNICEF, uh, you see uh, two of these are about sanitation and about water. And they talk about food deprivation that also has a water linkage. So, uh, you know, I think you get the point that water is uh, important. A number of the Millennium Development Goals were related to water. And here, uh, approaching 2012, uh, we can safely say that we're not going to make most of these. Uh, the idea about um, you know, reducing uh, the proportion of people that do not have access uh, to water, to basic sanitation, uh, combating desertification, uh, integrated water resources management and efficiency plans, uh, helping developing countries uh, so that they monitor their use of water and assess the quantity quality, right, and coordination among intergovernmental bodies. So some progress in these areas, uh, mostly not a lot. Right. So, you know, we. You know, we think about the big river, we think about paper mills, you know, we're not you know, necessarily thinking about, you know, sort of the global picture, right? So these are, I mentioned the example already of uh, glaciers, right? There are pictures of this happening all over the place, uh, you know, rather than sort of a, a slow sort of seasonal uh, freshwater supply coming from uh, glaciers is sort of a rapid retreat happening happening around the world. Uh, we can look at the uh, polar ice caps, which are melting um, faster than can be explained by climate change alone. There may be some uh, positive feedback loops we don't fully understand. Uh, but you know, the um, minimum extent of the uh, ice sheets uh, shrink, or yeah, the maximum extent actually in the summer. Wait a minute, I got that backwards. So the, yeah, the minimum extent in the summer is actually shrinking. Uh, sort of year by year, and it's uh, accelerating. And uh, you know, there's talk about you know, having a northern passage uh, from the from Europe basically to Asia, uh, just by boat. Uh, there's regional concerns. Uh, southwest, southeast. Uh, you know, Atlanta. We got anybody from the southeast, like Atlanta area? So is that a real issue? Got better for a couple of years, right? And I'm from Tennessee, so we're doing fine with water. Yeah, so go down a little bit farther. Right? And, uh, yeah, so you, maybe you could share with your friends a dispute from a few years back. So that's sort of a global view. So we looked at the U.S. view. Our crop irrigation is a big one. Uh, industrial sure. operations, you know, it tends to be higher than in the U.S. And then the domestic uh, use is roughly the same as uh, the U.S. in the global picture. So obviously, it's not the same story everywhere, right? I look at irrigation in Egypt, right? Uh, you know, very small percentage uh, used uh, in the home. Most of the water, most of the scarce water, you know, obviously scarce in, in Egypt, uh, being used for crop irrigation. So this just gives you a sense of the heterogeneity of water usage. So this is uh, liters per person per day, something like uh, 400. Uh, so close to a maximum, and you know you see minimums. Uh, 20 liters uh, per person per day is sort of uh, what the World Health Organization calls a minimum. Go ahead, Chelsea. Yeah, per person. <laughs> Like in the home, not. Yeah, not the total, which is a bigger number. <clears throat> Sorry. If you look at that number, it's bigger. About here. So I got that one up for you. It's down in the lower left corner here. So about um, 3,000 liters per person per day, if you look at everything. So the numbers, if you add the percentages, they don't quite line up, but they're in the certain uh, same magnitude. So this one's just looking at, and we saw a figure like this in the, the first day of class, you know, physical water scarcity, uh, at risk of it, uh, where places where there's sufficient water, 
and uh, economic scarcity is about having access. Okay. So we're with the big river. The point of all this is to say that with the big river, we're talking about industrial pollution, right? And that's just one piece of this. We could talk about uh, home use and recovery. We could talk about power plants. We will talk a little bit about power plants later in the term. We're not going to talk a whole lot about agriculture. Together, that's the whole story. Okay, so I just want to focus and sort of pull back before we uh, continue on our journey to the uh, big river. Okay, so just big picture stuff here, some basics. See a lot of heads nodding, so not too many surprises. Any questions before we move back? Go ahead, so um, I'm looking at the in the part of India. And that kind of looks very different from what I know <laughs> the, the water availability there. You know, the part the that's red. Economic scarcity in the uh, east or yeah, because the physical that's, water in that's the That's like the wettest, the wettest part of the world is in the northeast of India. It's here. <laughs> I mean, northwest of India, sorry. So, uh, northeast, this is, sorry, northeast, sorry. Uh, let's see. So, they got part of that's not estimated. And yeah. then you've got this light pink. Going on, it'll be this one. So saying. No, I'm, I'm talking about the northwest, the the red part. Yeah. Here, right? Yeah. No, so the, the, the red, the red. Northeast. Oh, you mean northeast? Oh yeah, northeast. Sorry. All right. Yeah. So that's about access. Yeah. It doesn't mean there's no water there. Okay. It means that uh, there is a lack of access to all the people, generally driven by economics. Is that more consistent? Perhaps, yeah. <laughs> okay. Does that refer to like infrastructure? It, it's yeah, infrastructure. It's an infrastructure issue. Okay, perhaps, yeah. As I know, those are the mountainous regions and uh, the monsoon season, which is the rainy season in India, they have plenty of water available. Yeah. But during There's a place called Chera Punji that now. it doesn't stop raining throughout the year. <laughs> oh, hold on, I keep, I keep dominating. So, uh, winter through summer, when, the, when it's not raining, the water runs, runs down to the plains and and people living uh, not exactly on mountains, but uh, on elevated areas, they don't have access to so, so the question I would ask the both of you, this is not just a, a uh, quantity supply. It is a quality supply. So does that water get treated? And is that water used in, in a way consistent with uh, the kinds of health standards that no. folks would no. look at? All right, I think, yeah, I see some head shaking. No, so that's where this is coming from. It's about treatment in that case. 